undergraduate class of 2020, majoring in biology and in chemical engineering. I will be your master of ceremonies for today's celebration. In exploring and writing about the imagined foundations of a society and of a culture, we feel it very necessary to acknowledge the very real foundation of our own. We therefore acknowledge the indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of the land where this performance, this uh, lunch is taking place, and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land that we are performing on today is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and the forced removal from this territory, and we honor and we respect the many diverse indigenous people connected to this land on which we gather and perform from time immemorial. I would like to introduce first Rabbi Fisher and Reverend Keith Lucas, who will lead this morning's invocation. The Bible relates that when Jacob wanted to reconcile with his brother, he first underwent a nighttime struggle with a man, an angel, himself. They wrestled a long time, and Jacob was wounded deep in his hip. As the dawn's light broke, Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. And Jacob received a new name. He would be known for struggling with heaven and earth and ultimately prevailing. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. preached about the kind of hope that outlasts the struggle. He said, I believe that wounded justice, lying prostrate on the blood flowing streets of our nations, can be lifted from this dust of shame to reign supreme among the children of men. May we bear witness to the wounds of our history that have not yet healed, those wounds that we carry with us to this day. May we also see the blessing of the strength we have found as we continue to work to lift justice up and together to prevail. As our speaker, Kevin Richardson, tells us, we carry the scars and still we rise. Thank you, Reverend Keith Lucas and Rabbi Fisher. Now, in the spirit of our celebration of the life and legacy of Dr. King, we would like you to greet, shake hands with, talk to someone near you at your table and, or behind you for a few minutes. Thank you everyone for taking a few moments to do that. Hello. Thank you everyone for taking a few moments. We'll now 
start the, start the celebration. Welcome to the 45th annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration. We're very excited about today's event and are so happy that you are here to celebrate with us. I would like to take this moment to thank President Raphael Reif and Christine Reif, our hosts for this morning. I would also like to thank our honored guest and keynote speaker, Kevin Richardson, one of the Central Park Five. Thank you for joining us. Last night at a special dinner, the MLK Jr. Leadership Award winners were honored. We are very pleased to recognize these individuals and groups who embody the ideals of Dr. King in service to the community. Today, I would like to share with the audience this year's winners, as well as the names of the Martin Luther King Jr. visiting professors and scholars, and the names of the members of the Martin Luther King Jr. Planning Committee. All the names I'm about to announce are in your program if you'd like to follow along. I'll be asking each person to please stand up as I call your name. If the audience could please hold their applause until all each of the groups are announced. Starting with the Martin Luther King Jr. Leadership Award recipients, we have undergraduate student Megan Davis of Biological Engineering. Grad, grad, if you could please hold your applause until the end. <laughs> grad student Stephen, Stephen Barr in Sloan Management. Faculty, Sandy Alexander, Associate Professor in Literature. Staff, Gloria Anglon, Assistant Dean of Graduate Education Headquarters. Dana Cunningham, Executive Director of CoLab in Urban Studies and Planning. And the group Delta Phi Epsilon. You may applaud now. <laughs> I would now like to recognize the 2019 to 2020 MLK visiting professors and scholars. Please stand as I call your name, and again, please hold your applause until the end. Rhonda Y. Williams, Jamie Macbeth, Tina Opie, Benjamin McDonald, Kaso Akochaye Okuju, Matthew Shoemaker. I would like to thank all of the members of the Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration Subcommittee of the Presidential Committee on Race and Diversity to whom we owe this wonderful event. Please stand as I call your names. Committee members include Asiya Adams Heath, the co chair, yeah. Heather Konar, also co chair, Kofi Blake, Narissa Clark, Sharon Clark, Catherine Gaman, Daria Johnson, Deborah Liverman. Caesar McDowell, Karis Moses, Paul Paravano, Christine Reif, Zena Queen, and Nai Toiloy. Thank you all for contributing. <laughs> the theme for this year's celebration is Have Courage, Speak Up, Confront Injustice. Today, we are here to celebrate the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Each year, we search the vaults of history to find a fitting and a moving quote relevant to the current state of affairs. This year, our theme have, is have courage, stand up, speak up, confront injustice. So as not to mince words, I would like to share the full quote that it was adapted from. Never, never be afraid to do what's right especially if the well-being of a person or animal is at stake. Society's punishments are small compared to the wounds we inflict on our soul when we look the other way. In my time at MIT, I have been an advocate for the development of safe spaces and communities on campus for underrepresented minorities in dorms as well as in leadership development programs and clubs. And so I would like to say that these days, as the rights of so many people of color are blatantly violated in our nation as we approach our next election cycle starting now and once again confront voter disenfranchisement based biased by race and class. It is more important than ever for each one of us to do what we know is right. 
it is imperative that we prevent any amount of danger we can from being inflicted on any member of our MIT community and of the communities that we are all a part of. As the new outbreak of the coronavirus threatens the health of those exposed, we also must stand up for the Chinese members of the, our community who might be being discriminated against for their, um, for their community. Those who have the power to speak up, to speak out, and to advocate against injustice in any form must find the courage within ourselves to do so. To speak more on these themes, I have the pleasure of introducing to you two of our very own, Kelvin Green and graduate student Candace Owen. They will guide us in reflections on the life and the legacy of Dr. King. We will hear first from Kelvin, followed by Candace. Um, good afternoon. Um, I would want to first acknowledge God, who is the head of my life. Um, he is just and righteous and gives me the courage to fight for a country and world that is just, wise, and redemptive. Um, thank you to the MLK Committee for inviting me here today, and I'm grateful for my fraternity brother, Dr. King, um, who spoke out many times, whether it was when his government allowed mass disenfranchisement of constitutionally granted rights, um, or when his government allowed or sorry, or when his government was committing war crimes in Vietnam. Um, his truth-telling practice inspires, and I'm also grateful to have my parents with me here today. As much as I am the son of a minister and a scientist, I am likewise the child of the Mattapanai and enslaved people. And so as much as I am proud to have studied in the halls of MIT, I also recognize that I am only able to stand here because of those who stood before me because of those who laid the foundation of a place they never had the chance to stand on. I honor them in their traditions of love and grit today. To speak at this time on February 12th, 2020, is to speak at a time when common values of humanity, leadership, and integrity are not commonly practiced. It's to speak at a time when the occupant of the White House is daily and systematically dismantling protections, rights, and resources for millions of people people in the room today. It's to speak at a time when there is utter disregard for fairness and integrity at all levels of authority. It's to speak at a time of senseless violence in this country and the world that affects mothers and sons, fathers and daughters. It's to speak at a time when our immediate future as humans is uncertain due to the climate change we are driving. It's to speak at a time when it feels like no one is listening. In the years I've been at the Institute, I've been in many rooms with many of you where we've talked about diversity, equity, inclusion, how we chart a path forward from here, what our next steps are to become a better MIT, how we resolve food insecurity, how we respond to a swastika being drawn on the BSU's Black History Month display, how we challenge ourselves day in and day out to be committed to justice. However, in many ways, it feels like these conversations fall on deaf ears and idle hands. It feels like these conversations lack a level of seriousness and urgency that inclusion demands. It feels like the voices of students speaking out against policies and practices that infringe upon our community and our values has been normalized so much so that we treat student activism not as a sign that our institution must do better, but a sign that our student voices need to be managed, contained, limited in their ability to impact the image and reputation of MIT. It feels like we've forgotten that students are what make MIT what it is and that you can judge any educational institution by how it treats its students, that you can judge any progress of a predominantly white institution by how it treats its low-income black and brown students, not based on numbers, but their stories. So to speak at this time, when disinformation is widespread, when there is a lack of trust locally and nationally in leadership, and what is right and what is wrong are being treated the same way, it is to declare that we are in a fight for the souls of our institutions, whether we know it, and regardless of our willingness to believe it. Six months ago, I was preparing to start my third year at MIT. However, the week before returning to campus, I heard back from Josie Valentin, the Massachusetts State Director at Warren for President. Soon after, I had the opportunity to be a regional organizer and work with hundreds, nearly thousands of people right here, talking to them about what's at stake in America, what's at stake in 2020, 
and advocate for the candidate I felt best suited to meet the challenge. I vividly remember November 9th, 2016. It was my 18th birthday and the day the occupant was reported elected President of the United States. I remember feeling tired from 5 a.m. canvassing on election day and frustrated at the end of the day results. I detached from news outlets and forgo paying attention to what was happening in the world as much as I could. I turned inward. And I feel like many of us instinctually do that in response to injustice, turn inward. It took some time, but I began to re read more. I studied more. I processed more. Thus, in the spring of 2019, I was thinking about the 2020 election, that we need to stop the occupant's re-election if we want to save any semblance of the nation we live in or that my ancestors built, that to defeat a corrupt and cheating man, all hands have to be on deck. I answered the call and left MIT to do so. Administration, faculty, staff, students, and guests, I stand before you today with a heart filled with optimism and hope. Optimistic because the power that's needed to change is in this room right now. Hope because I am with all of you now, each of you with your own families and colleagues, friends and communities, each of you with the essential ability to organize those networks. I'm here to tell you today that each of you has the power to create the world that Brother King sacrificed his life for right here at MIT. Let's be motivated by his dream in 1965 Let's be unified by his dream that became a nightmare in 1967. And you may feel like your single voice lacks impact, but no single person can do anything sustainable. It takes people, and there are enough people in this room right now to make MIT reflect high ideals, community values. There are enough people in this room right now to make MIT a beacon of light in a world that is getting darker and darker. But our opportunity to reflect light, to transform into this beacon is exponentially decreasing. We are running out of time. To the administration, I addressed you first, among those present, because you all are in a position many of us dream to be, to be able to make decisions that have long and lasting impact and to facilitate the growth of great minds from across the globe. However, with great power comes great responsibility. You define MIT's values and you define it every time you speak or don't speak. I ask in each of these moments, you challenge yourself to meet the moment with bold action, like Dr. King. We are counting on you. To the faculty, you interact with us as we grow in knowledge and discover worlds once foreign to us. We spend many of our hours in your classrooms. They become the places where we learn more than the syllabus material. We learn more about ourselves. In the past 20 years, student populations have diversified to students of varied experiences and backgrounds. The battle of inclusion is fought in your classrooms and office hours every day. I know some departments recognize and act upon this understanding. I hope this becomes our institutional norm. To the staff, thank you. And when I say staff, I first think of the offices that have supported me immensely while I've been in Cambridge. Many of you are the support networks that have helped me to remain encouraged at MIT, and I know I don't stand alone as a student in saying that. Thank you for the peace you bring in peculiar times and for reminding us that before we are students, we are people. Thank you for taking the time to see us and support us. And to the staff that we don't get to spend our days with, those behind the scenes advocating on our behalf, sometimes by name, though we may be here for four years and never learn yours, we see you now and we say thank you. And to my peers, whether graduate or undergraduate, eyes are on us. People from around the country and globe, people we haven't even met yet and may never meet, are watching our move. They are going to be influenced by what we choose to do in this world good or bad. That's what lies in our hands. Our experiences are the results of this ancient college experiment, and we must continue to speak up and speak out for it to be a success. The bureaucracy of demanding better can be frustrating. However, we must persist through it. Because if we don't, then the spirit of complacency will set on our community. Disruption is what pushes a society, and yes, a school, to reconsider. To reconsider how it runs, to reconsider its purpose, to reconsider its practice. Being disruptors as students who chose this community and are the lifeline is a role that's importance cannot be understated. And as I speak, I'm also disturbed because I know what we fight against. I'm disturbed because we fight against a society where profit matters more to those in positions of power than human lives. Our MIT education sim seems to be made in order to funnel us into this apparatus where coveted industry positions perpetuate this semblance of security that's predicated on the exploitation of others. 
where we are taught to be leaders, but in parallel, it seems like we are being taught to be followers. And so to exist at this moment in time in the world and at MIT is a chance to make history, if we want to, if we fight for it. So I encourage all my peers in the fight for a just world and campus to keep fighting, keep writing, keep drawing, keep dancing, keep singing, keep protesting, keep speaking, keep going. Our art and our protest is how we keep our community free. It is how we discover the true meaning of leadership. It is how we have courage, speak up, and confront injustice. And as much as we acknowledge Dr. King today, we also acknowledge the thousands of men and women that made the movement he represents possible. The poor people, the women, the college students, Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, the Greensboro Four, Baird Rustin, nameless people and countless faces, yet present and fighting for the world they desired together. I'd like to leave you all with the words of a soul who inspires me daily, Toni Morrison. I know the world is bruised and bleeding, and though it is important not to ignore its pain, it is also critical to refuse to succumb to its malevolence. Like failure, chaos contains information that can lead to knowledge, even wisdom, like art. Thank you. Tough act to follow. <laughs> My name is Candace Ross. I'm a fifth year PhD student in computer science and a Howard University alum. I'm honored to be speaking here today. This year's theme, Have Courage, Speak Up, Confront Injustice, gives us three concrete calls to action. In a way, the straightforward nature of these calls is a little uncomfortable. We're calling famous quotes like, the young always inherit the revolution, Huey Newton, or hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that, today's namesake. The call to action in these quotes is a bit abstract. And this abstract, high-level nature gives us a lot of wiggle room. We have the wiggle room to equate being good humans with fighting systemic inequities. It's the wiggle room that lets us say we value diverse views while not having diverse bodies in the room. And it is, unfortunately, the same wiggle room that allowed the Epstein money to walk into our doors. In my second year of grad school, shortly after the 2016 election, I got an email. And what was striking was the email's intro. Hey, Candace, as an activist, we were wondering if you'd be interested in organizing an allyship workshop. Those words as an activist. <laughs> I mean, for undergrad, I did attend the Howard University, the host of the infamous Malcolm X, Baird Rustin debate, the alma mater of Toni Morrison, Elijah Cummings, Taraji P. Henson. I had the privilege to walk those grounds in the heart of our nation's capital as a teenager. Even being empowered by those who'd gone before me, I was brought back to the question, am I an activist? To be honest, I felt like a complete imposter. I checked to make sure they emailed the right Candace. I checked who they were because phishing is real. <laughs> and I checked with myself. I asked myself, am I really an activist? Am I really qualified to create and lead this workshop? The theme again, have courage. I ran the workshop and in many ways, it was a catalyst for me on campus. At this point, I've been the graduate resident advisor for Chocolate City for four years. I've served on many working groups around diversity and inclusion, and I've been on the executive board for the Black Graduate Student Association and the MIT gymnastics team in hopes of channeling that Simone Biles energy. <laughs> but my experience is not unique. Many students, many of my wonderful peers here today, especially from marginalized backgrounds, provide a lot of courageous labor at MIT. And these are the things that you can't add to your CV and that don't come up in technical interviews. This labor, this activism is tiring yet important. So thank you to every student who contributes to our community in this way.
So I briefly mentioned the Epstein scandal. Why even bring up Epstein when there are many questionable donors on campus? Now, at the start of grad school, my close friend, a powerful scientist and wonderful woman of color who is also a survivor of sexual violence, told me how hard it was to find the necessary campus resources. She reached out to tons of people seeking changes as simple as having a support group like her undergrad did. And when she asked why we didn't have a support group, she was told the staffing for this group just wasn't in the budget. So it appears that of the nearly $850,000 Epstein donated since 2002, there were zero dollars in the budget for a survivor support group. This is a painful truth for many people on campus who have been either directly or indirectly impacted by sexual violence. And my friend continued to push and shortly after, mental health and counseling ran a support group for about four months and we also recently received an email that MIT is looking to start a support group again. So my friend's actions of speaking up as our theme calls us to do had an impact. Saying Me Too provided visibility and accountability. Now, Me Too is much more than just a recently popularized hashtag. It's a social movement begun by survivor Tarana Burke in 2006, a black woman who truly embodied the second part of today's theme by boldly speaking about her experience. We have so many Tiranas here on campus, my friend being a prime example, who have also boldly spoken out. We know that social movements are powerful ways to create change, especially on college campuses. So to the many Tiranas here at MIT who have spoken out and pushed for change, we owe you a huge debt. A last key debt owed is to those who embody the final part of today's theme, to those who have fought and continue to tirelessly fight injustices. From my grandparents and even my parents' childhood, my parents are here as well, the flavor of American racism has changed. Now my uncle went to a segregated elementary school, and that is my uncle. <laughs> In theory, segregation is unconstitutional today. In practice, segregation exists by strategic zoning and inequitable funding, something that's present even here in Cambridge. And the government cannot, in theory, disenfranchise voters on the basis of race. This disenfranchisement happens in practice through mass incarceration and the permanent removal of voter rights. And we don't, in theory, discriminate in college and graduate admissions. Unfortunately, this is undermined in practice by the nepotistic structure of grad school reviewing. And this hits close to home for me because when I started grad school in 2015, our graduate community was only 5% Latina and just over 1% black. The numbers for the indigenous community weren't even reported, I imagine because they were too small to not be personally identifying. Now this part of the theme about confronting injustice relies in particular on those in power to make changes. These necessary cultural shifts represent a burden too heavy even for MIT students. This is a case where the young cannot exclusively lead the revolution. Tenured faculty members will have to be the ones pushing for admissions reform, pushing recruitment efforts geared toward underserved populations, and pushing cultural shifts to make our spaces more welcoming. This is an area where saying we care about diversity in a one-page statement is not the same as concrete action geared toward reform. So despite what feels like almost insurmountable barriers, how can we be optimistic? I think here we owe a thank you to those in power across faculty and staff who have actively used their platforms for change. These are the Gloria Anglons, one of our award winners. The Chris Prathers, the Leslie Kolajeskis, the Wes Harris's, the Ed Birchingers, we could go on. And again, a thank you to the students who, as always, continue to make their voices heard. These are through efforts like the BSU and BGSA and LGBTQ plus recommendations, countless campus petitions, and so much more that I'm sure I'm completely unaware of. The people using their platforms and power to change the system and rebuild it in a more just and equitable way do give me hope. So we all have a responsibility to view these concrete calls to action, have courage, speak up, confront injustice, as crucial for systemic and lasting change. This is truly a shared responsibility and change requires contribution from everyone. My experience at MIT has been really amazing due in large part to the people, many of whom are in this room. 
I love our culture of constantly evaluating the status quo and refusing to be complacent, and I'm excited to see where our community goes. Thank you all for your time today, and happy Black History Month. Thank you to Candace and Kelvin. Once again, I would like to thank both of you for your thoughtful and perceptive remarks and for letting the words and ideals of Dr. King be heard once more. I would like to introduce now, for the start of our musical selection, Glenda Poe, support staff at MIT Medical, and Corbin Swain, graduate student in biological engineering, who will perform who will perform Glory by Common and John Legend. One day, when the glory comes, it will be ours, it will be ours, oh, one day, when the war is won, we will be sure, we will be sure, oh, glory. against yes glory is destined every day women and men become legends sins that go against our skin become blessings the movement is a rhythm to us freedom is like religion to us justice is juxtaposition in us and justice for all just ain't specific enough one son died, his spirit is revisiting us. True and living, living in us. Resistance is us. That's why Rosa sat on the bus. That's why we cry in lobby seven to say enough is enough. When it go down, we woman and man up. They say stay down and we stand up. Shots, we on the ground, the camera panned up. King pointed to the mountaintop and we ran up. One day. When the glory comes, it will be ours, it will be ours, oh, one day. When the war is won, we will be sure, we will be sure, oh, glory, oh, glory, oh. But we'll fight on to the finish. And then when it's all done, we'll cry glory. Oh, glory. Oh, oh, oh. We'll cry.
Selma is now for every man, woman, and child. Yeah, Even yeah. Jesus got his crown in front of a crowd. Yeah. They march with the torch. We gonna run with it now. Never look back. We done gone hundreds of miles from dark roads, heroes, to become a hero. Based in the League of Justice, his power was the people. Enemy is lethal. A king became regal. Saw the face of Jim Crow under a bald eagle. They came. We follow. Robert, Marina, peace at them, protest, we do it for our children. When? When will the numbers match the mission? Mind and hand and feet, the Holy Spirit gives us vision. No one can see it through individually. It take the wisdom of the elders and young people's energy. Welcome to the story we call victory. The coming of the Lord, mine eyes have seen the glory. One day, when the glory comes, it will be ours, it will be ours, oh, one day, when the war is won, we will be sure, we will be sure, oh, glory, oh, glory, ah. We'll fight on to the finish, and then when it's all done, we'll cry glory, oh glory, ah ooh yeah, we'll then cry. song talks about glory yeah. I can keep going. and it talks about <laughs> what we're looking to now where, where I grew up when we talk about glory we're talking about a future that God has for us that we've been brought into this fold we've been transformed we've been rearranged and that's what we have to do now we have to say what does it look like to be different what does it look like to be changed from the inside? What does it look like to say, my eyes have seen? Not where I am now, but where I will be. I appreciate y'all's words, Candace, Kelvin. When we ask the question, when will the numbers match the vision? Mind and hand, the spirit gives us vision. We're walking somewhere, but we have to see where we're going. That vision takes courage. That vision takes us speaking up. Like King said. We'll cry glory. Oh, glory. Glory. Thank you, Glenda and Corbin, for your absolutely incredible and moving rendition of that tribute to the Selma, Alabama marches fighting against voter disenfranchisement and police violence in 1965. It now gives me great pleasure to welcome the 17th president of MIT, Raphael Reif, who will speak to us before introducing our keynote speaker. Thank you, Gianna. Thank you, Glenda and Corbin, for that absolutely wonderful, wonderful performance of glory. And good morning, everybody. And good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm grateful to everyone who helped bring us together to today, including the MLK Planning Committee and the Office of the ICEO. And I note that we're joined by three members 
of the Cambridge City Council. Dennis Carlone, Paddy Nolan, and Quinton Sondervan. Could you please stand up for we, we to thank you? <laughs> thank you so much for finding the time to join us this morning. Thank you. I want to express my admiration for the courage and dedication of our student speakers. Kelvin and Candice, your creativity, your persistence, and your leadership make us all very proud. And Kelvin, once you've finished the crucial work you're doing to help the nation, please come back. <laughs> MIT needs you too. In a moment, I'll introduce our keynote speaker. But before we hear his remarkable story, I'd like to offer one observation and then share a piece of exciting news. Candy spoke about courageous labor, the selfless, unseen work that so many students do to support one another and to try to build a better MIT. In the midst of such labor, it can be hard to see or appreciate how much progress you are creating. So I simply want to say to Candice, to Kelvin, and to everyone here, thank you for all you do. And please know that you are making, you are making a lasting difference. Many of the best ideas we have acted on in the past few years have been inspired by our students. Things like building diversity training into first year orientation, recruiting and hiring a growing team of mental health counselors with expertise in race-based trauma, having the members of every academic department create a statement of shared values, and improving our student service surveys to better reflect the way individuals from underrepresented groups experience MIT. Students advocated for all of these ideas. And the process continues. As we announced a few weeks ago, each of MIT's five schools and the College of Computing will now appoint senior staff specifically to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and community efforts. Students strongly urged us to take that step too. Is every problem solved? Obviously not. But I hope we can all take hope and inspiration from all the change we have made and can make working together. Now I promised some news, so let me share a development I believe will be extremely positive for our community. After a nationwide search, we have found an outstanding candidate to serve as MIT's next Institute Community and Equity Officer. And he will start with us on March 15th. His name is John Dozier, and he comes to us from the University of South Carolina, where he currently serves as their Chief Diversity Officer and Senior Associate Provost for Inclusion. John created that role at the university, and he built broad support for a strategic plan to guide and align USC's many diversity, inclusion, and community building efforts. This foundation of trust and mutual commitment enabled the university community to address a range of challenges, including coming to terms with the history of enslaved people on their campus. At MIT, the ICO needs to be at least four things at once. A thought leader on the subjects of community equity, inclusion, and diversity. A focal point for organizing MIT's related activities and conversations. A hands-on doer who disseminates best practices and who inspires the awareness and positive energy to help them flourish and an active partner and convener for the many people throughout our community deeply engaged in this work, including many of you. John brings to this role an outstanding record of leadership, great personal warmth, 
and a sense of curiosity, energy, and experimentation that feel very MIT. Among his previous jobs, he served as president of a 7,000 student community college in Chicago. So he knows a great deal about creating change in a complex organization. In the letter, an MIT news story that came out later this afternoon, you can read more about John's background. But I want to call attention to one image, one image that captures in a beautiful way the amount of change possible in a lifetime. John is originally from Columbia, South Carolina. And for six generations, his family has owned a house right near the University of South Carolina. Needless to say, for a long time, the university was entirely white. As John tells the story, when his grandmother was a teenager, she attended a school on the far side of the university. But as an African-American high school girl, she had to walk around the campus, never through it, simply to avoid the threat of racial insults and violence. So you can only imagine how it felt for her six years ago when she learned that her grandson would become the university chief diversity officer. To succeed in our mission at MIT, we urgently need to make our community work for everyone. I hope you share my optimism and excitement about what we can achieve with John's collaborative leadership. I look forward to working closely with him and with all of you as we strive to create a community we can all take pleasure and pride in being part of. And I know we will give John and his family a very warm welcome when they get here. For bringing us this wonderful talent, please join me in thanking all the members of the search committee, and especially the co-chairs, Associate Provost Tim Jamieson, and former interim ICEO, Alice Johnson. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure in my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, an individual who has suffered crushing injustice and yet has found the courage to speak out for systemic change. In 1989, when he and four others were falsely accused of a brutal attack and rape in New York City Central Park, Kevin Richardson was just 14 years old. The case attracted intense media attention, and the boys became known as the Central Park Five. Burdened with a five to 10 year prison term sentence for a crime he did not commit, Kevin served five and a half years until he was released on probation. Much later, after a 12 year court battle that ended in 2014, all of the Central Park Five convictions were overturned, and they became the Exonerated Five. Kevin Richardson. <laughs> Kevin Richardson lost his freedom in much of his childhood, but he has transformed this terrible injustice into a relentless commitment to drive positive change, to promote DNA evidence as a way to help people trapped by wrongful convictions, and to reform our criminal justice system for the good of all. Please join me in offering a very warm welcome to Kevin D. Richardson. Thank you, sit down. <laughs> Dr. King, thank you MIT for inviting me here. Whew. Speak up, stand up for injustice. That's what all I'm about. 
What I'm going to do right now is to tap back into 31 years. Is that OK? For those of you not, who do not know me, my name is Kevin Richardson of the Exonerated Five. That feels good to say, exoneration. Not just exoneration from our sentence, but just exonerated from all the injustices that we went through, all the name calling, the list goes on. But I wanna go back into the night of April 19th, 1989, approximately eight o'clock p.m. There was a young kid in Harlem, New York City, waiting to play basketball, as you've seen when they see us. Naive to life, just curious in general. There was many things I wanted to be. I wanted to be an artist, I played the trumpet. I wanted to be a basketball player, I wanted to play for Syracuse University. By the way, I'm very blessed that Syracuse has honored me with a scholarship in my name called the Our Time Has Come Scholarship for people that, of color that has financial means that they cannot make it to college. If I was to pass away tomorrow, my legacy would continue for generations to come. So the night of 1989, here I am 45 years old, and I still deal with that every day. You might see me well put together, a little dapper here and there, but like my good friend Yusuf, my good brother Yusuf Salam say, we have indelible scars that nobody sees. Money, a lawsuit cannot replace what we endured. If I had a choice, I would take that back right now. Going back in 1989, I could remember going into the park, not knowing that I would not come out seven years later. And it was not five and a half, it was seven years I was incarcerated. I just want to make that known because every single day counted in behind those walls. I could remember going to the park and yes, there was some mishaps going on in the park that I was not part of. Once I seen that, I realized this is not a place for me. I have to get back home. I wasn't scared about the police arresting me. I was scared about my mother, Grace Cuffey, <laughs> getting back home before curfew. That's how I was raised. My mother grew up in the South. She grew up in the Jim Crow era. She told me stories about how the KKK used to run into people's houses and drag them out. Now thinking back at 45 years old, wow, it's the same mentality that happened to me and my brothers. We were dragged out of our houses and put into an institution which is called the criminal unjust system of New York. Going through that process, when I got into the precinct, I still did not know what I was there for. Remember, I was 14, very naive, which is okay at that age, because you're still trying to find yourself in life. I still didn't understand what happened until, until it was too late. And what I mean by that was after interrogation was done, after we spent 12 to 36 hours in confinement without parents. At that time, my sister, Angela Cuffey, she came to the precinct, but everything was done already. The interrogation process was done already. I was in my third day already, locked behind those four walls. 
And my dear sister, she tells me to this day, she's okay now, but she say that it was part of her fault. Because she was 21 years old. She was still young at the time, too. And she, she said that it was her fault because she let that happen to me. A good guy named William Kunstler at the time said Jesus Christ himself got us off the case. That's how our cards were stacked against us. That's how harsh it was. So I'm, I am so like honored and blessed to be even mentioned in the same breath of Dr. King. To know what he went through to know that I went to similar situations. How he was fighting against the world. He was fighting for justice. He was fighting for peace and prosperity. Not till I realized I was older that I was built from that same DNA. While in prison, I lost my faith. Yes, I believe in God, Jesus Christ, I'm a Christian. At 14, 15 years old, I lost that faith. Because I wondered why would God do this to me? My mother from the South, she said, Kevin, <laughs> boy, don't ever question God. I said, okay, Ma, I mean, but why? Why us? She told me, why not you? I still didn't get it. Until I got older and I realized that I was destined to be here. Just like when you're a kid, a baby, and you're being conceived in your mother's stomach, we go through a process where we're molded and shaped to be a certain way. And I was molded and shaped to be the man that I am today. To be a leader. To speak for courage. To stand up for injustice. Not just for myself. Not just for my people of color. For everyone. That's what King represented. It. Going through the incarceration process. Being sentenced to five to ten years for a crime I didn't commit. Knowing that my family was there every step of the way with me. Coming to see me in prison four, four hours from New York, Kaksaki, New York. Every week. In this area, you know how snow is. The same as upstate New York. They still came to visit me. They gave me the strength to keep going, to see my kids, well, not my kids at the time, well, my nieces. I have kids now, not at 14. <laughs> but they were like my kids. My beautiful niece, Rashida Diche, which is an artist, she's 30 years old now. I remember she was eight months old on the visiting floor. And that shows me how much time went by. Going through my incarceration was very tough because there's two things that you really don't want to go to prison for. You don't want to go at all, but to be labeled a rapist and a sex offender is very harsh. The only thing that trumps that, trump that, wow. Um, <laughs> I would never use that word in my speech, but I was just saying, um, it's child molestation. And to be labeled that at such a young age, sometimes I ask myself, how did I survive? How did my brother survive? How did my family survive? We just survived. We just did it. Just when Dr. King was going through everything he was going through, he just kept going. From being physically harmed by people, from being hosed down, he just kept going. 
And just what we did, we, my brothers, my family, as time goes on, when I'm in, in, the, in jail, in prison, the years go by. I'm thinking that, well, I will beat my case on an appeal because I still had high hopes because I thought we didn't commit this crime. There's no way I'm going to do five years. Five years came and went. When I went into the parole board, my record was superb. I had no, no priors, no issues. I was a model citizen. But that didn't matter to the parole board. After all my achievements, graduating, getting my associate's degree in prison in 1995, it didn't matter. They asked me one thing, did you do the crime? I said, no. They told me, thank you. I'll see you in two more years. So I wound up doing seven out of 10 years. Me and my brothers often speak about this, that at the time, we really didn't understand what was happening, but we knew that we would not admit to a crime we didn't commit no matter how long the time went on. I knew eventually, sorry, I knew eventually that I would come out. And when I speak to un uh, at universities and to kids, when they come up to me and ask me, how did you get through this? And I always say this thing, and it's cliche, but it's very true. I said, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I know for me personally, being in prison, and being in those four walls, I remember being dark, but looking up at the, at the light. And as each day goes by, it's getting brighter and brighter. That was God talking to me. That was God telling me to come through the light. That was God telling me to beat the odds. Because statistically, I'm 45 years old, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to have been dead at 25, or in jail, or still in jail, which is there are so many people that's still in jail to this day. Even though I went through what I went through, that, this great ordeal, I have to become the voice for the voiceless. There's many people that are still incarcerated to this day that are serving life sentences that are innocent. And that's why I'm very passionate about working with the Innocence Project. Thank you. <laughs> um. <laughs> With the passions that I have, my brothers and the Innocence Project, is very sincere because we truly want to see people come out of prison that's innocent of the crime. It's a serious thing. It's an epidemic right now for being people being incarcerated. In so many states, Texas, just people are getting fried, and fried meaning, you know, executed. But I must keep on. There was a time where I didn't want to speak in front of a crowd. I could have easily been like my, my great, my brother, Antron McCray, if any of you seen when they see us, he still refuses to be shown in public. We understand where he's coming from. So when I'm up here speaking, I represent all five of my brothers. I'm here by myself, but we're, we're together in spirit. You know, um, not wanting to speak to the community, not wanting to show people who I am at the time I thought that, because we thought the whole world was against us. It felt that way, at least. We always had our supporters, but it seemed like the negativity was overwhelming the positivity. I can remember going to court after being, re being released. Well, being released, the whole court process before going to prison, 
Sometimes I have to pinch myself that I actually went through that. Because there were times where we, it was a, it was paparazzi just trying to get to the courts. And there were signs up of, of us, of people calling us, guerrillas, urban terrorists, a wolf pack, thugs, scum of the earth. The list goes on. But it was still my mother beside me telling me, Southern voice, Kevin, <laughs> lift your head up high. So if you've seen any old footage of me, you've never seen me covering my face going into court. I held my head up high because I know I didn't, I didn't do anything. There was nothing to be ashamed of. God knows, my family know who I was, who I am as a man. There was no way I could do any harm to a woman. I was raised by my mother and four other women in my house. I'm the youngest of five, the only male, four other sisters. Now as an adult, I'm surrounded by more women. <laughs> my wife and I have two girls. So it was nothing but women in my life. So when I was accused of this crime, it was just hard that people actually believed that, but they didn't know me, Kevin. So to say a humble guy that I am today. Now I'm just a gentle giant, that's all it is. I'm still Kevin, I'm still the same person. After being incarcerated, it was an ongoing struggle trying to find work because I was honest. I put down on my uh, application, have you ever committed a crime? Have you ever been accused of committing a crime? Let's get that right. In the last 10 years, I put no because I didn't. I met all the credentials for the job. I remember one time I was turned down by the post office and uh, until they seen who I was, they said, oh, thank you, but we're good. It crushed me because there I was trying to strive in this society that didn't accept me, didn't accept my brothers, didn't accept the pictation of my skin, the color of my skin. And that was one strike against me already. Like my brother Raymond Santana, if you see him when they see us, he had no choice but to result to selling drugs in New York City. That's where they want you to go. They want you to result to that so they can say, you see, we knew they were no good. Now my brother Raymond Santana, he had this, he had this reason why, because he couldn't survive. He was a grown man living in this household. If you've seen when they see us, it was an overcrowded apartment. He had to get out. I didn't choose that way, but I could have easily went down that road. Because the perception of us are that we're no good. We're raised in this, in this concrete jungle, which is called the ghetto. But just because you live there, that doesn't become you. Yes, I came from Harlem, New York City. I'm proud of that. But I was able to get out. But after serving a sentence for a crime I didn't commit. But after getting released, I kept moving. I kept striving. Dealing with first parole, I did seven years. Then I had to do three more years on parole. You add it up, that's 10 years of being, you know, obeying to someone. I could have easily cracked, but I didn't. Because I believe for what I stood for. I believe in carrying a legacy for Dr. King. 
to add insult to injury, even when you're down, the system still tried to knock me even further down because I had to reg register for something they call Megan's Law. And anybody familiar with that, Megan's Law, if you're a sexual predator and you have to register every month. And there's three levels of Megan Law. I was on the third level, the highest, level three. That means I couldn't come in feet within a school. Everywhere I went, I had to say, hi, my name is Kevin Richardson, and I'm a sex offender. That's hard for anybody, but imagine being 14, 15, 16 years old. After being released, I'm 22, 23 years old, and I still had to obey to this, these rules. Did I crack? No, I didn't. I still went on with it. Somehow I did. God wouldn't let me. He wouldn't let me succumb to this. I had to keep going. It came on a time when I went to the, the sex offender classes that I said, it was enough is enough. I'm not going anymore. At the time, I didn't realize what I was doing, myself and Yusuf Salam. We just stopped going because we didn't belong there. We were ready to even be violated, to go back to prison because we were standing for what we believe in. Like you never give up on what you believe in, no matter what the consequences are. Who does that remind me of? Dr. King. And all my great forefathers and leaders of this time. Even going further into this, we had to pay for our classes. Yes. We had to pay $20 a week to go to these classes for something we didn't do. And that was another stack against you because when you come out of prison, sometimes you can't find work. So how do you get the money? You get the fast money from the streets. So it was all built. The system was all built to divide and conquer. And that's what they did. They divided us and conquered us. They tried to conquer us, our egos. They tried to conquer our families. But we were bigger than that. We still survived. Now, fast forward a little bit. I'm, I'm going through the years for you. fighting for the lawsuit. 2002. Going through these, going back to court again, going through depositions, hours of work. Now, I just wasn't going through my lawsuit. I was involved because I learned when I was in prison, I studied in the law library. So I know a little bit something about it now. So I'm actually working on my case as well. Going through trial, going through the depositions, interviewing the people that interrogated us, interviewing Elizabeth Leatherer. Yeah. Then interviewing Linda Fairstein. Interviewing Michael Sheehan. These are all people that was involved in our case. And we sat there right across from them as they were getting interrogated. That was a great feeling. And you know what? As a woman and a man, they would not look us in our eyes. Because we knew it's in our hands now. They could not stare us in the eyes just to, to show eye contact. Because they know what they did to us it was inhumane. These people tried, they tried, but they didn't strive to dehumanize us. They really did. They never thought in a million years that our case will resurface some 30 years later. 
sometimes I don't have time to reflect because I'm, I'm in the trenches. I'm every day traveling. I'm every day raising awareness. Sometimes I don't have time to reflect and, and pinch myself to say, wow, look what I've been through. Because I feel that we still have a lot more time to go. We have a lot more to do. I'm not settled. I'm not happy for what's going on in this world. Now I think it's my due diligence to carry on a legacy, to use my platform to raise awareness to others, to inform people that might have been privileged, that don't know how it is to grow up black and brown. And if you don't know, I invite you to follow me. Come join my world so I can show you that if you understand that maybe we can make this world a better place, that we understand each other and everything that we went through. And that's another thing as far as the police department. I would love to work with the police department to build centers for people, centers for kids, so they could get to know the police in your neighborhood so we can respect each other. Because that's something that's missing. Like growing up in the 80s, we had something that's called PAL. We had rec leagues that we played basketball for. I was quite good, ask about me. <laughs> um, I'm considered old, even though I'm in my 40s, but I'm considered old to play basketball. That's what my nephew said. Um, <laughs> but um, I remember all these years fighting for the lawsuit. Our case was overturned in December 2002. It took 12 years, I repeat, 12 years to get our lawsuit. Mr. Bloomberg, Michael, He just wouldn't let up. He refused to pay us. And let me tell you something. It's not about the money. It's about what was owed to us. Because like I say, no amount of time, no amount of money could bring back those years that we lost. Those precious years that I lost, going to the prom, Going down the street, going to Walmart, <laughs> things that I do every day. If I could get that back, I would take that any, any day. But we kept fighting, because we knew there was light at the end of the tunnel. We knew that one day, people will see us for who we are. People will see us. People will hear us. People will be inspired by us. And the feelings reciprocal will be inspired by other people. Last night I had a dinner. It was a beautiful uh, event and I met some young inspiring people and uh, at the table I was at. And it was awesome just to be inspired by them. And I told them that, that you inspired me just as much as I did, as I do to you because I was robbed of the opportunity to go to a university, to show my talents, to show people who I am from the inside out. You know, um, it feels great literally to be alive, to have dialect with, with people that's younger than me, to have dialect with people that's teenagers or young adults. Because I, you know, I look at myself, I'm, I'm a very humbled individual, I'm just Kevin. But it's great that people look at me in such a iconic level. It's still hard sometimes to even process that. But I'll take on that. Because we need some people, we need some modern day kings here. We need people to fight for justice. We need people to change the criminal landscape of how the society is. We need people to change the dynamic of how they think of people of color. 
They need people to, we need to change people's thought. That when we was brought into America, we was kings and queens always. We was raised as that. My father, God bless his soul, he passed away in 2009. He would have loved to, you know, to see what's going on right now. Because he was always about love, self-empowerment, loving yourself. My father, Paul L. Richardson from Virginia, he served our country in the Navy for 30 years then went to work in the post office for another 30 years. I miss him daily. But I know he's, he's smiling at me right now. Now, when They See Us came out, it changed everything for me. It was a drastic change for myself because I'm really just, literally, I'm just a at-home dad, really. I like, I like that. But now that When They See Us came out, what must we do now? Okay, it came out, but that's not it. Now we have to start the conversation of how to change these laws, how to make sure there will never be a Century Park slash exonerated fire how there will never be another Scottsboro's voice. How it will be another, not be another Emmett Till. So the list goes on and on. So now, being here and just being in the same breath and the same conversation and to go and travel for, and raise awareness for Dr. King, I take that honor. I thank you all, sincerely from my heart. This means, this means the world to me and my brothers. And you won't see the last of me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much once again to Kevin Richardson of the Exonerated Five for his inspirational remarks. We will conclude today's program with the singing of Lift Every Voice and Sing. We ask that you join in and sing the first verse of the song. The lyrics are located on the back of your program. Our very own Heather Konar co-chair of organizing this event will lead us in song. After the song, Reverend Keith Lucas and Rabbi Fisher will come back up to give us the benediction and lunch will be served. If everyone could please stand.
must march on till victory is won. As we go forth, let us consider this story told by Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. Sometimes, you know, it's necessary to go backward in order to go forward. That's an analogy of life. I remember the other day I was driving out of New York City into Boston, and I stopped off in Bridgeport, Connecticut to visit some friends. And I went out of New York on a highway that's known as the Merritt Parkway. It leads into Boston, a very fine parkway. And I stopped in Bridgeport, and after being there for two or three hours, I decided to go on to Boston, and I wanted to get back on the Merritt Parkway. And I went out thinking that I was going towards the Merritt Parkway. I started out, and I rode, and I kept riding, and I looked up, and I saw a sign saying two miles to a little town that I knew I was to bypass. I wasn't to pass through that particular town. So I thought I was on the wrong road. I stopped, and I asked a gentleman on the road, which way would I get to the Merritt Parkway? And he said, the Merritt Parkway is about 12 or 15 miles back of that way. You've got to turn around and go back to the Merritt Parkway. You are out of the way now. In other words, before I could go forward to Boston, I had to go back about 12 or 15 miles to get to the Merritt Parkway. May it not be that modern man has gotten on the wrong parkway. And if he is to go forward to the city of salvation, he's got to go back and get on the right parkway. Now that's what we've got to do in our world today. We've left a lot of precious values behind. We've lost a lot of precious values. And if we are to go forward, if we are to make this a better world in which to live, we've got to go back. We've got to rediscover these precious values that we've left behind. Thank you everyone who's here today for coming. I hope you've enjoyed this morning's program. It has been a wonderful event, which I hope has inspired you all to not only remember Dr. King's words, but to act upon them. Happy Black History Month. We invite you to stay for a delicious lunch now. <laughs>